Hi everyone, my name is Matt Etherburn, and I am I'm excited to record um, this webinar and presentation. This was a presentation that I gave at the ACL Study Day um, that we hosted at UCLA a couple of weeks ago uh, that was put on by um, South Coast Seminars. And before I get started, I do have to um, thank Matt Bobman, who helped organize this event. Um, it was a, um, a fun um, and engaging event, and hopefully um, this presentation is helpful for you guys, specifically those of you that are treating patients um, after ACL reconstruction. So what we're gonna talk about um, today is current evidence for return to support clearance decision-making after ACL reconstruction. I have no disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. So this slide highlights the objectives for this um, presentation or for this webinar um, and provides a roadmap for what we'll talk about today. Um, so we'll start with talking about the current state of return to support outcomes after ACL reconstruction. Secondly, we will um, go over some definitions as well as the stakeholders that are involved or ideally involved in return to support decision making. Um, we will cover current evidence that we have to support safe and effective return to support clearance decisions in individuals after ACL reconstruction. Uh, we'll then talk about a couple of emerging concepts related to return to support, specifically the importance of psychological readiness and um, this emerging concept of workload management. And then lastly, we'll talk about some rehabilitation strategies, um, or really more specifically testing strategies during rehab um, that we can use to mitigate the risk of poor return to support outcomes. In the United States, ACL reconstruction is the standard of care after ACL injuries, particularly in young athletes. And the general expectation is that ACL reconstruction will restore joint stability and allow these athletes to return to their pre-injury activity or um, sports participation. However, when we look to the literature as to how many athletes actually return to sport after ACL reconstruction, we see that unfortunately this isn't the case. And seminal work in this area was done by Claire Ardern and colleagues in a recent systematic review and meta-analysis. And this study found that when examining return to any level of sports participation over any period of time after ACL reconstruction, um, which included the synthesis of 57 studies, um, this uh, meta-analysis found that 81% of athletes returned to um, sport, again, when considering any level over any period of time. However, when examining return to pre-injury level of sports participation, which included synthesis of data from 50 studies, um, the study found that only 65% of athletes after ACL re reconstruction return. And then I think even more eye-opening when examining return to competitive level sports, which included the synthesis of data from 30 studies, only 55% returned to their previous level of competitive sports. And then in those that do return to sport, previous work from Mark Paterno, um, who also presented at ACL Study Day, um, and colleagues found that approximately 30% of athletes that return to cutting and pivoting sports after previous return to sport clearance um, sustain a second ACL injury over the, the following two years after their um, return to sport clearance. Additionally, a recent meta-analysis from Wiggins and colleagues demonstrated that 23% of athletes younger than 25 years old sustained second ACL injuries after a return to sport. And then further, in those that return to sport and also don't sustain an additional injury, multiple studies um, have also demonstrated reductions in performance as well as career longevity um, after returning to sport participation. And these return to sport outcomes, um, really um, poor return to sport outcomes are in stark contrast to our patients' expectations. Um, and this is from a study by um, Kate Webster and Julian Feller um, that was published earlier this year. And um, this study found that uh, when um, asking patients after ACL reconstruction whether they expected to return to the pre-injury level of sport, 84% of patients after ACL reconstruction expected um, to return to pre-injury level of sport, and that was across all patients um, undergoing ACL reconstruction, including um, revision um, surgeries. 
And in those with a first-time ACL reconstruction, that number is even a little bit higher. 88% of patients with a first-time ACL reconstruction are going into that surgery or that procedure and into their rehab expecting to return to their pre-injury level. So in light of these poor return to sport outcomes and this disconnect between our patients' expectations and um, the outcomes that we're seeing in the literature, we know that evidence-based um, decisions regarding rehab completion as well as return to sport clearance are critical in this patient population. And additionally, these findings raise several specific questions that I hope we'll address uh, during this presentation, which include how we define return to sport, um, how we decide that an athlete has sufficiently recover to allow safe um, return to sport, what we should test and what thresholds we specifically should aim for or ensure that our athletes reach prior to return to sport, and then lastly, how we best involve the patient as well as other stakeholders in this decision. And so starting first with defining return to sport, uh, most of what we'll discuss was adapted from the 2016 Return to Sport Consensus Statement, which was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine a few years ago. The first author was um, Claire Ardern. At first, it's important to note that return to sport may mean different things to uh, different people or the, the different stakeholders in this um, process. For example, for the athlete, return to sport success may mean returning to sustain participation in their sport as quickly as possible. And this would be an example of a goal-focused definition. For the coach, in contrast, um, the definition of successful return to sport may be more performance-based, where the athlete returns to their prior level of performance in order to um, contribute to the team's um, success. So again, the performance of the athlete and the success of the team are the primary goals. And then for clinicians, like the majority of us likely listening to this, um, our definition of a successful return to sport may involve returning the athlete while ensuring that she or um, he doesn't sustain any um, additional injuries, recurrent or um, new injuries. It's also important to recognize that the return to sport process is a continuum. Um, in which we have an evolving process moving from return to participation to return to sport to return to performance. And we'll talk about each of these individually. So in the return to participation phase, the athlete may be participate, participating in rehab. Um, they may also be participating in sports training. This may be modified or unrestricted, or they may be participating in sports, um, but all of this is at a level lower than um, his or her or the athlete's return to sport goal. And here the athlete is physically active, but they're not yet ready, whether that be medically, physically, and or psychologically to fully return to sport. In the return to sport phase, the athlete has returned to his or her defined sport, um, but at this stage, they are not performing at the desired performance level. And then lastly, in the return to performance phase, the athlete has gradually return to his or her defined sport and is also performing at or above the pre-injury level. There are also multiple contextual factors that play into the return to sport process, and these include the type of severity of injury, the athlete's age, their sport-related demands, the level of participation that they are planning or, um, return, or um, seeking to return back to, as well as the significance of returning to participation. And this might um, include things such as whether they're returning to a final season before retiring, uh, before finishing their collegiate career, um, if their goals to return to sport include the pressures of a championship, um, championship game or playoffs, things along these lines. It's also important to recognize what stakeholders are involved in the return to sport decision. And ideally, this is a shared decision that involves the athlete, first and foremost, alongside um, clinicians, so the clinician's op um, opinion or clearance decision, um, as well as coaches and others um, dependent on the specific situation. And having multiple stakeholders involved, re involved requires um, that there are well-defined roles and plans to avoid any type of 
um, athlete coercion in this process. So this is really, really critical when you have multiple stakeholders involved. So a good place to start to discuss the clinician's contribution to the return to sport process is to go through what typically guides return to sport clearance decisions after ACL reconstruction. And to do this, we're gonna use a scoping review that is um, hot off the press um, that was published just this year um, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, um, and that aimed to answer this exact question. And so this review included 209 total studies evaluating return to sport criteria used for return to sport clearance after ACL reconstruction. And the most frequently used criterion, uh, maybe unsurprisingly, was post-operative time. Post-operative time was used by 85% of their included studies. And that's what you can see shown in this figure highlighted here. It's the proportion of studies um, on the y-axis over time on the x-axis. So time was used by 85% of the included studies. And in 49% of the studies, post-operative time was the only criterion that was used to determine return to sport clearance um, and readiness for return to sport. So no other measures, including objective or patient-reported measures, were used. And the second most commonly used criterion were measures of muscle strength. Um, however, these were used in only 41% of the included studies. And there was wide variability in the type of muscle strength tests used as well as thresholds used. So these included tests done on isokinetic or electromechanical dynamometers, using handheld dynamometers, um, using um, machines such as the leg press machine or knee extension machine um, to perform the testing, as well as even um, only performing manual muscle testing. Which I hope through this uh, presentation I will convince you guys not um, to do. Uh, the third most commonly used cri individual criterion was single leg hop testing. However, this was used in only 14% of studies uh, determined to determine return to sport clearance um, readiness. And various hop tests and thresholds were used, again, in the studies that were included in this um, scoping review. And these included single leg hop tests for distance, which I think most of us are probably familiar um, with. These are forward single leg hop tests, which are shown in the figure on the left. Um, and some additional single leg hop tests that were used included the forward, um, forward hopping for time, um, one example being the six meter time hop test, um, a side to side hop test, as well as vertical jump tests. In addition, only 12% of studies used a patient reported measure to make return to sport clearance decisions. Only 4% of studies reported if the patient was asked if he or she was ready to return to sport before being cleared. And then lastly, only one study reported um, evaluating psychological readiness. And then among performance-based measures, only three studies included any type of measure to evaluate movement quality or neuromuscular control uh, to assist in the return to sport clearance decision. So now that we know a little bit about the state of the literature and clinical practice related to return to sport clearance, and that we also see that objective measures are not used the majority of the time, um, the next question that's raised is what is typically recommended in consensus statements or practice guidelines? And we're gonna summarize these fairly briefly, but what we see is our most common recommendations are post-operative time greater than somewhere between generally six to nine months, muscle strength being um, greater than 90% when looking at limb symmetry measures or limb symmetry indices for the quadriceps and the hamstring um, muscles. And so again, limb symmetry measures are calculated by taking the injured strength value, dividing it by the uninjured limb strength value, and multiplying that by 100% to have a measure of symmetry. Uh, performance measures, um, being greater than 90%, so single leg hop test performance being greater than 90% limb symmetry. Patient reported function at a level that represents um, relatively normal knee function um, or normalized knee function, so it's typically recommended to the score above 90. What we see used most often are uh, patient reported questionnaires such as the IKDC subjective knee form or the COOS. And then lastly, movement quality being evaluated in some way. However, what we do lack currently is clear standardization of the assessment of movement quality, and we'll talk a little more 
um, on that later in this presentation. Okay, so now we're gonna um, focus in on a few of these um, recommended measures and thresholds um, to review our current evidence that we have to support some of these recommendations. And we'll use this figure as a model for discussing recommendations for return to sport decisions. And this is a figure that's um, adapted from a similar model that was published um, in a review paper by Joanna Kavist in 2004, which you can see the reference on the slide. Um, and again, we're gonna focus on the evidence for these four factors that we have um, um, shown in the figure here, being muscle strength and performance, performance measures such as single leg hop tests, um, assessments of movement quality, and post-operative time. And we'll start first with the evidence for muscle strength and performance after ACL reconstruction as it relates to safe and successful return to sport. So to start, we'll look at the evidence we have related to muscle strength and risk of re-injury. Starting with this study from Grindem and colleagues, which was part of the Delaware Oslo ACL cohort study. Um, and this study found that participants who sustained additional knee injury after return to sport following ACL reconstruction had lower quadriceps strength symmetry prior to uh, return to level one sports compared to those without additional injury. You can see these uh, values highlighted in the table here, uh, being 84% in those that did not sustain re-injury and 75% in those that did. And when they dichotomized into groups above and below quadriceps strength symmetry of 90%, um, they found that those with strength symmetry above 90%, only 12.5% sustained re-injury while um, a third of those with quadriceps strength symmetry less than 90% sustained re-injury. In a similar study in 2016, um, the discharge criteria used prior to allowing return to sport included greater than 90% limb symmetry for quadriceps strength, as well as uh, performance on three single leg hop tests and meeting some cutoffs on um, several agility uh, tests and measures. And the findings for this study, only 10.3% of those who met all of these discharge criteria prior to returning to um, soccer uh, sustained a graft rupture after return to sport. And again, this was only focused on ipsilateral injuries compared to, again, a third of those who didn't meet these discharge criteria. So to summarize, we see that quadriceps strength symmetry greater than 90% is associated with a an overall decreased risk of second ACL injury. Next, moving on to muscle strength and the ability to successfully return to sport. Some of our recent work from the ACL relay study at Ohio State and Cincinnati Children's, um, which is an ongoing cohort study led by uh, Mark Paterno and Laura Schmidt, um, found that those who met 90% um, on both quadriceps strength and hamstring strength at the time of return to sport clearance um, continued in sports participation over that following year at higher proportions than those who didn't meet both of these cutoffs. And so you can see these values here. Those that had strength above 90%, 81% of them um, over the following year continued in the same um, level of sports participation compared to only 60% of those who had strength less than 90%. In the same cohort, this study by Laura Schmidt found that those with quadricep strength symmetry greater than 90% at the time of return to sport had both higher IKDC scores at the same point in time, as well as better hop test performance at that same point in time. And similarly, some of our additional work published recently found that the individuals with quadricep strength above 90%, again, tested at the time of return to sport clearance. Um, when we followed them over the next year, we found that um, again, those with 90% um, strength greater than 90% demonstrated higher scores on both the COOS sport as well as on the IKDC one year later, and also demonstrated um, a higher likelihood or higher proportions of reporting COOS scores that demonstrate um, a threshold of um, functional recovery um, I, the following year after their return to sport clearance. So again, to summarize, we see in the literature that quadriceps strength symmetry greater than 90% is also associated with better return to sport success, as well as better cross-sectional and longitudinal knee function. 
Next, we're going to move on to discussing the evidence supporting performance um, measure testing. And really, this is going to focus primarily on single leg hop test performance. We know from a bulk of work from um, Claire Ardern and colleagues that um, more symmetrical single leg hop test performance is associated with a higher likelihood of successful return to sport in the one to two years following ACL reconstruction. This was found in several studies. Additionally, more work from the Delaware Oslo cohort study in Dave Lagerstedt in 2012 found that higher single leg hop test symmetry at six months, which again is typically near the time of return to sport clearance or testing. So higher single leg hop test um, symmetry at this point in time was associated with increased odds of having a normal IKDC score or normalized knee function six months later, so at, at a year. So to summarize, we see in the literature that single leg hop testing symmetry greater than 90% is associated with better return to sport success, as well as better long-term knee function. Next, moving on to movement quality as a part of the return to sport assessment. A seminal study in this area from Mark Paterno and colleagues um, at Cincinnati Children's tested drop landing mechanics um, during a um, drop vertical jump task using three-dimensional motion capture and they tested and evaluated landing mechanics during this task at the time of return to sport and this was done in 56 young athletes after ACL reconstruction and they followed these athletes for the year after return to sport to identify the occurrence of second ACL injury and this study found that side-to-side -side asymmetries in sagittal plane knee moment at the time of return to sport. Really this kind of represents a strategy where they favor um, and land first on their uninjured limb. That this strategy at the time of return to sport was associated with approximately three times higher odds of second ACL injury over the year following return to sport. Another analysis that I was involved in from the same cohort, uh, divided young athletes after ACL reconstruction into symmetric as well as asymmetric landing groups and this was done during a single leg drop landing task where they drop off of a box and land on a single limb and we focused in on three key variables that we know um, are commonly altered or asymmetric between limbs during a single leg task and these were knee flexion excursion um, peak internal knee extension moment as well as the amount of uh, or degree of trunk flexion and we found that those that had asymmetries in knee flexion excursion at the time of return to sport, um, so more representing more of a stiff knee um, landing strategy when landing on that single leg, also then subsequently reported lower coup scores two years later. So again, to summarize the evidence related to movement quality um, at the time of return to sport clearance and outcomes following ACL reconstruction, we see that more symmetric landing mechanics during both double and single leg tasks uh, are associated with decreased second ACL injury risk as well as better long-term knee function. So lastly, moving on to our evidence related to um, time recommendations, we'll return to the same Grindham study that we discussed earlier that was published in the British Journal of Medicine in 2016. And in a an important finding from this study, uh, besides the strength findings that we already discussed, was that the re-injury rate when they followed their athletes over time um, after uh, the time of return to sport was reduced by 51% for each month that return to sport was delayed until they reached nine months after surgery. Then they found that this risk reduction really leveled out and was observed um, and wasn't observed following this nine month point and this may be an important time threshold to consider in return to sport clearance decision making and then in support of this finding a recent study from jacob capen and the university of delaware group found that um, despite similar recovery of knee function um, and having all of their athletes meet rigorous return to sport criteria um, this study found that when they focused in on and analyzed their female athletes that sustained second acl injuries um, after the time of return to sport, they found that those that had second ACL injuries only differed from those that didn't have second ACL injuries in post-operative time from surgery to return to sport clearance, um, with the return to sport time being 
approximately nine and a half months or over nine months in the group that did not sustain second ACL injuries and at 6.8 months in the second injury group. And again, this was um, after meeting rigorous return to sport discharge criteria and not having any evidence of um, clinical um, or biomechanical impairments that differed between, between um, groups. And a nice synopsis related to this finding is here, and this is taken from this paper. And so what um, they suggest is that delaying return to sport clearance after ACL reconstruction even in the absence of clinical or biomechanical gait impairments may mitigate second ACL injury risk in young female athletes. And so lastly, to summarize again, we see in our current evidence that delaying return to sport greater than nine months after ACL reconstruction, even when meeting uh, return to sport discharge criteria, is associated with de decreased risk of second injury. So the next quest question is, in light of the evidence that we have to support these thresholds, how well do we actually do in getting our ACL reconstruction patients to meet these thresholds as a whole um, in our um, clinical practice prior to um, allowing return to sport? And to start, we'll return to this paper of ours by Tool published in JOSPT in 2017. And here we examined how many participants met relevant return to sport cutoffs or recommended return to sport cutoffs after already having prior medical return to sport clearance and discharge from rehab. So we enrolled these participants after they had been cleared and tested them. And when we looked at strength, we found that only 28% had um, greater than 90% limb symmetry for quadriceps and hamstring strength at the time of um, return to sport clearance. And for single leg hop tests, when we looked at the proportions that met um, greater than 90% on all single leg hop tests, so that's this figure or this, um, these um, bar graphs down at the end, we found that only 52% had greater than 90% limb symmetry for all single leg hop tests. And then overall, only 14% of these participants met all return to sport discharge criteria within four weeks of their previous return to sport clearance, which included uh, these measures of muscle strength, quadriceps and hamstring strength, single leg hop test performance, and uh, patient reported function using the IKDC. Additionally, we propose that the differences in the proportions meeting these different return to sport discharge criteria or different measures also indicates that performance on one test doesn't necessarily indicate successful performance on another test and um, likely supports a multifactorial testing approach or, or framework, framework. So to support these findings, um, I'll highlight just one additional study from Ali Gokler um, and their um, data and group in 2017, which similarly found that only 7% of their patients who had had previous return to sport clearance actually met recommended return to sport discharge criteria, and they evaluated um, similar to our study, uh, muscle strength, single leg hop test symmetry, um, function using the IKDC, and also included a movement quality measure. So overall, we can see that we clearly have work to do in this area in getting our patients to meet recommended um, return to sport um, discharge cutoffs or thresholds. And as we get into kind of near the end of this presentation, we'll discuss a little more why I think um, we're seeing these results uh, with regard to our discharge criteria with our ACL reconstructed patients. So, in, in, in addition to the discharge criteria that are commonly recommended, including time and physical impairment based measures, I wanted to discuss a couple of emerging and important concepts to consider in return to sport clearance decision making um, after ACL reconstruction. And we're really going to focus on psychological readiness, as well as um, this concept of training and workload management. So starting first with psychological readiness, we return to a lot of the research by Claire Ardern, who we've seen cited a lot throughout this presentation. Um, and a lot of her work has shown that fear of re-injury and lack of confidence following ACL injuries and ACL reconstruction play a big role in whether athletes are um, able to be successful in return to sport. 
And specifically, this meta-analysis in 2014 found that a positive psychological response, which was measured using the ACL RSI score, which we'll talk a little bit about in the next slide, had the largest impact or effect on successful return to pre-injury level of sport over time. Um, and this had an even larger effect than um, being young um, or having even played sport at a previously elite level. So positive psychological response um, had the largest effect on successful return to sport. So a little bit on the ACL RSI. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with it or don't use it, I would um, really recommend you look into it and consider using it. This is a patient reported scale that is thought to be uh, more specific to um, um, fear and confidence related constructs for individuals that have had a knee injury as opposed to a more general measure like the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia. Um, and we'll talk a little more on, on relevant thresholds with this scale um, near the end of this presentation. So in addition to the previous meta-analysis, there have been multiple other studies that have found that fear of re-injury and confidence are critical factors with regard to enabling successful return to sport um, after ACL injuries um, or ACL reconstruction. In addition, um, one other study to highlight, this is a recent study published earlier this year by Mark Paterno and Laura Schmidt. And this study found that in young athletes that had high fear, and this was measured using the Tampa scale, so you can see the Tampa 11. Um, those that had high fear at the time of return to sport clearance had approximately 13 times the odds of sustaining second ACL injuries over the two years following their return to sport clearance. So to recap, we see in the literature that higher fear, less confidence, or less psychological readiness for return to sport are associated with much worse return to sport success as well as maintenance of sports participation over time, as well as potentially, at least in one study, in increased risk of um, second injury. So the second emerging concept relevant to the return to sport process is workload or training load management. And a lot of this work comes from Tim Gabbett and his colleagues. And this idea of workload is defined as the amount of training that the athletes competed completed over the time of recoup recuperation to uh, be adequately prepared for the demands of the game or sport. And several studies from this group have shown that acute spikes in workload relative to their chronic recent workload, um, which is um, defined as this acute chronic workload ratio, and this is these, these um, spikes or higher acute to chronic workload ratios would be something that we would see in the initial return to sport phase for athletes um, that are recovering from ACL reconstruction where they're moving from very little training and traditionally potentially to kind of um, once they're cleared full training and participation and this may be associated with increased risk for these athletes although to my knowledge this hasn't been studied specifically in those with ACL injuries. But if we even think um, kind of practically about how we might address this concept in the return to sport phase of rehab and, um, and um, return to sport clearance decision making, really it requires us to think about using a periodized approach for our recommendations with regard to return to activity. And this might include the transition of sport specific training from more controlled to less controlled environments, similar to what these athletes might face in sport, but doing this in a supervised um, uh, context, followed by a return to reduced level team training without contact, followed then by a return to full or normal training with contact, followed then by a return to exhibition games and starting initially not over the full duration of the game or the match, um, and then progressing to full duration. And then lastly, um, a return to competitive matches or games, again, starting not initially over the full duration and progressing toward the full duration of the game or the match. So we see this gradual progression of workload over the return to sport um, process. 
Okay, so now to shift gears a little, um, knowing what we know regarding the importance of strength, function, movement quality, and psychological readiness after ACL reconstruction, how do we go about measuring these um, either from a gold standard, kind of research-based approach, but, but more importantly, in the clinic to inform our return to sport clearance decision-making? So for muscle strength, um, we know that our gold standard to evaluate uh, strength is using an isokinetic or an electromechanical dynamometer, which you can see um, here on the slide. Um, and we can evaluate um, isokinetic strength, we can evaluate isomet isometric muscle strength um, at varying speeds, which we can see shown. Um, but um, we know that many clinics don't have access to isokinetic dynamometry. And so what I want to cover a little bit are some clinical correlates that we might consider. Um, and so for those that don't have access to a dynamometer or an electromechanical dynamometer, um, one potential clinical correlate is using handheld dynamometry. And some keys here are being consistent with um, our setup of our patients and avoiding compensatory muscle action. So figuring out ways to stabilize the limb, to stabilize the thigh or the trunk. Um, using consistent side-to-side -side measures. Also, um, research from Terry Grandstaff recently showed that um, positioning the handheld dynamometer actually as a strain gauge, which is shown in this figure on the slide, um, highlighted um, with the box, figure B, um, is actually more comfortable, leads to higher peak forces, and is more valid when compared against isokinetic dynamometry measured strength. So this is a consideration for um, a handheld dynamometer testing approach that might be uh, more valid than um, other setups. And even in the absence of a handheld dynamometer, even using one repetition max testing on the knee extension machine correlates fairly well with Biodex measured strength. Um, however, it does often overestimate symmetry values and if this test is the mode of strength testing, likely higher symmetry values may need to be considered, something like 95 to um, even 100% symmetry between limbs for the one rep max test. To measure movement patterns or biomechanics in the lab, as a gold standard, we use three-dimensional motion capture for research studies. Um, however, in the clinic, there are several approaches for evaluating movement patterns or control, beginning with an overall qualitative assessment of movement, um, and this might include with running, with jumping, with landing tasks, as well as using things like um, 2D video. Um, and I think something else that's really important is, is thinking about ways that we can formalize um, our assessment of movement um, with our patients, even if it's done so in a qualitative way. And so recently, some clinically relevant qualitative assessments of movement have been, de have been developed. And one is shown here on the slide from Harrington and colleagues. And this is a grading criteria to use for evaluating single leg squat as well as single leg landing. So for example, landing from a single leg hop test. And you can see that this scale evaluates um, their arm strategy, their trunk alignment, pelvic position, lower extremity control, um, and their steadiness during the landing itself. So this is a scale that might be able to be used when evaluating um, single leg hop test performance as one example. So we can see that in this example, clearly this patient does not have steady stance when they land, um, that they have compensatory trunk uh, movement and arm strategy. Um, and so this would be something that we, we could use this scale to compare in a consistent um, and systematic way uh, movement quality between limbs. Another potential task to evaluate is the tuck jump test, and this is something that's been reported in uh, multiple previous studies, and this is evaluated primary, primarily for control and fatigue. You can see on the slide here that we have different um, criteria to evaluate, including knee and thigh motion, foot position, and their plyometric technique. And this really is a demanding task um, in which the athlete is cued to jump as high as they can, while also bringing their knees up to their chest and performing this in rapid succession for 10 seconds. Um, you can see um, a dynamic and challenging task. Uh, 
and here from the front. So this is something that we could consider evaluating or scoring um, using the scoring system and kind of, again, formalizing our assessment of movement quality. Additionally, um, evaluating movement patterns, another possibility is using two-dimensional video assessments. So currently there are a bunch of these available, one example being Dartfish, um, but there are others that are easy to integrate on our um, smartphones or other devices. And so some key things here um, in the slide, uh, you can see this um, athlete has, is performing a drop landing task where they're dropping off of this um, plyometric box and landing on a single limb. And so here we're looking for some things like um, when they perform this drop landing, are they using a stiff knee strategy? Do they have an overall lack of trunk control? Do they demonstrate excessive dynamic valgus? And these are things that you could measure using two-dimensional assessments. So regarding the evaluation of psychological factors, the most common and pertinent scale to evaluate uh, psychological readiness that we already discussed briefly before is the ACL RSI or the ACL return to sport after injury scale. So while there are no currently well-established or universally recommended cutoffs currently, what has been proposed most often is a score of greater than 56. Um, I think another thing to consider is that it also isn't known currently um, how to differentiate these different constructs of fear and confidence, or if there is a kind of quote unquote healthy amount of fear or lack of confidence and how psychological readiness overlays with physical readiness um, to contribute to risk of injury or, or return to sport success. And so researchers continue to work in this area and hopefully we'll continue to see some work that'll help to better support how we evaluate um, psychological readiness. So now to kind of put it all together, I really like this figure from a recent review paper in sports medicine um, that has a, I think, a nice all-inclusive consideration for return to sport and really rehab or um, best practice for um, care for individuals that sustain ACL injuries. Um, and I'm happy to um, share this paper with anyone. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, but you can see this involves um, preoperative rehab, undergoing um, ACL reconstruction if that's the plan of care um, or the decision for this athlete, undergoing criterion-based postoperative rehab, undergoing return to sport testing, um, followed by a gradual periodized return to sport, um, performing shared decision-making to arrive at a decision of return to sport clearance, and then, um, if possible, um, having additional follow-ups throughout the return to sport process. And then specifically for decisions of medical or clinical readiness for return to sport clearance, I'd recommend, uh, based on the synthesis of the evidence, an overall at least nine months post-surgery, in addition to no pain, um, a fusion and full knee range of motion, what's generally termed as a quiet knee. Patient reported function at normal or recovered levels and at least evaluated with the COOS or the IKDC, a score greater than 90. Having strength and hop test symmetry greater than 90%, I think even the ideal might be higher, closer to 95 to 100%. And this is based on some of the limitations of limb symmetry measures, which we haven't talked about in this presentation, but um, include the potential for uninjured limb detraining over the course of rehab. And so shooting for higher limb symmetry might be getting them even a little closer to their pre-injury level. Um, another thing that we didn't discuss a lot in this presentation is what thresholds um, for um, absolute strength when normalized to the participant's mass we should aim for, but there is some evidence to suggest getting people to um, around or above three newton meters per kilogram. So um, newton meters being the torque and normalized to the participant's mass in kilograms um, might be an important threshold for um, success af after ACL reconstruction. Um, ensuring that our patients have good movement quality with no asymmetry, um, and this can be evaluated um, during daily and sport-related tasks using some of the tools that we just covered. <laughs> 
And then lastly, um, ensuring that they're psychologically ready. So again, one proposed cutoff for the ACL RSI might be greater than 56, but at this point we don't know exact uh, cutoffs in how much confidence is too much confidence or too little fear or too much. Um, and so we can continue to learn more in this area. So to wrap it up currently, um, the best and most effective return to sport criteria and thresholds are still unknown. Um, in addition, return to sport is a complex process with many contextual factors to consider specific to each athlete. However, I think my most important take home point should be that objective testing works um, and we have to be performing serial measures to inform our rehab as well as our return to sport uh, decision making for these patients. And if we don't test, we don't know where to target our rehab and have something to base our decisions on. And again, we can't just rely on um, tests that underestimate capacity like manual muscle tests, hop tests potentially, or, um, or other clinical measures um, that don't give us a true um, assessment of our patient's function, strength, or capacity. So thank you for listening to this talk. Um, again, my name is Matt Ithaburn. Uh, my email address is on this slide. You guys can feel free to email me if you have questions. Uh, my Twitter handle is in the bottom corner. You can follow me there. We put a lot of our current work um, in this area um, out or put it out through social media. So um, if you want to follow me there, that would be great. Um, and thank you for listening to this presentation. Thank you.